Good morning. My name is Davis Jans. I'm one of the pastor elders here, and this is the time in our service where we continue our worship through prayer. And as we do that this morning, I, I will let you know that the passage of scripture we're going to be studying is one that cannot be taken lightly um, and that we really do need to prepare our hearts for. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We are just so grateful and we are so blessed to be able to gather and worship and fellowship, to be able to come to this building, to be able to open your word and study your word together with fellow believers. And as we do that this morning, Lord, I ask that you prepare our hearts well. And Lord, that you bind Satan from this place. This is a passage, Lord, that calls us, that convicts us, that forces us to take action and there is, no, there is no not reacting to this passage, Lord. So in this time, I would ask that distraction fade away, that worry and fear fade away, that your Holy Spirit be on Dr. Davis as he shares the word with us this morning, and it be on each of us individually. That our hearts be softened, that we are ready 
to hear your word, Lord, and I pray that you give us spiritual eyesight this morning, that you give us a vision for what it is you're calling us to. What is, what is it you're calling us to repent from? What sin do we need to turn from and turn to you? What action are you calling us to individually, as families, as churches, as a community, as a nation? What are you calling us to this morning, Lord? Help us to see that. Help us to seek that. Help us to be prepared for that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, at the conclusion of our service this morning, if you uh, do want to speak to someone or pray with someone, there will be folks available up front. Good morning. My name is Emily. I'll be reading our scripture today from Revelation 3, verses 14 to 22. Um, if you want to get one of the Pew Bibles in front of you, it's on page 967. Revelation 3, verses 14 to 22. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and solve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Emily. I'm Davis. <clears throat> I'm your transition guy today. Uh, we have a message prepared on the church at Laodicea. That is the last in a series um, that this church has been listening to and responding to over the last couple of weeks. And then next week, we're going to move into a new series of messages that help us focus our mind and our hearts on world mission, the, the reason why we're called together, and that's to make Christ known throughout the world. Uh, you'll notice that there aren't any of our senior pastors who are in the building this morning. <laughs> they are all on a well-deserved rest. And uh, so it's my privilege to spend a little bit of time with you uh, listening to what the Lord has to say about Laodicea. But this is a tough message. Of all of the messages to all of the different churches, this is the one that condemns the harshest. This is the one that looks pretty ugly from the surface. It's my sincere desire to be an encouragement to you this morning. I, I want that to happen, but the words here are pretty tough, and, and I thought I'd better warn you in advance. What we're going to do this morning is, first of all, go through a quick recap on, on what we have covered so far. We're going to keep this within 30 minutes, I promise. But then we're going to take a hard look at Laodicea and what their issue was and how the Lord Jesus addressed that issue. This is a little bit of a summary from a New Testament Bible commentator by the name of Beale, and he does a pretty good job. Let's kind of get caught up for the folks that haven't been able to attend some messages up until now. This is what the Lord says to the first six churches 
Christ commends the Ephesian church for their Christian teaching. But then he condemns them for their lack of witness. Then we move to the church in Smyrna, and here Christ commends the church for an enduring spirit in tribulation. But he tells them, he warns them that there's more severe temptation and difficulty to come. And then Christ commends the church in Pergamum for its persevering witness, but he also condemns it for its permissive spirit of idolatry. We move next to the church at Thyatira, and Christ commends the church at Thyatira for its Christian works of witness. But the other side is a condemnation for a permissive spirit of compromise. We move to the church at Sardis, and they were condemned for a lack of witness, and Christ turns around and commends the church at Philadelphia for its persevering witness, even in the face of tremendous persecution. And then we come to the church at Laodicea. And before we talk about that message, I think it's important for us to ask the Lord to help us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, forgive me for my lack of faith this week, for the weakness that you saw in your servant. I pray, Father, as the song says, that you will fill us with your spirit now. You'll guide us in the discussion of what the challenge was in the church of Laodicea, because the, the big problem here is that we'll see this as a historical look at, at a problem that Laodicea had and, and somehow skip over the fact that this applies to us too. Help us to see clearly, Heavenly Father, what you want us to see. I, I pray we walk out of here as changed people, as folks who are refreshed and encouraged, because at the end of this condemnation, there is a promise, and we're going to look at that together. I pray your blessing on our time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I come from a family of five. We grew up in Shemokin, Pennsylvania. And as you might guess, in a family of five, at any given moment, at least one person is in trouble for something that we said or we did. And that's when it happened. We would hear that loud, scorching voice, Jeffrey Mark Davis, get in here. My response was usually to run and hide. I knew I was in trouble for something. I began in my mind to search for what that, what that could have been. But when I heard my mother, who is the commander in chief of the Davis household, call you by your middle name, you knew there was something serious going on. In our passage of scripture today, the heavenly father is gonna call Laodicea by its middle name. There are some serious problems that are going on and we're gonna take a look at them. Um, I'd like to approach this by looking at three specific questions. And question number one is, what, what's the big deal with Laodicea? But why is this church one that the Heavenly Father is going to use as an example? The second thing we need to see is the tough wording that he uses. You heard Emily say that the Lord Jesus' counsel here is, you're not hot or cold, and because of that, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Why did Jesus choose those specific words? And finally, we have to come to a resolution here. What's the take home for me? What does genuine faith look like? Because it's obvious that the church at Laodicea is exercising a false faith. Now, before we get into the heart of the message here, I want to remind us of what Pastor Ben said when he started this whole series. What is the purpose for the book of Revelation? The purpose for the book of Revelation is it was written to provide a blessing to the church under fire in the last days by lifting our eyes to focus on the Lord Jesus. Now, as we started our passage of scripture, we find a description of the author here. And he says he is writing to the church at Laodicea, and these things says the amen and the faithful one and the true witness. Now, you and I know amen means so be it. 
It means what I'm telling you is absolutely, verifiably the truth. So Jesus is, before he starts this conversation, he's identifying himself as the faithful one, as the true one. And that's really important because he's going to call out Laodicea for not having faithfulness. Okay, step number one, here we go. What's up with Laodicea? Well, let's take a look a little bit at geography. I want you to have a little bit of an idea of where all of this is taking place. You'll see that all of the seven churches are relatively close together. They're in the eastern part of what is today Turkey. The purple circle is where John is located. He's writing the book of Revelation from the island of Patmos. The city that is circled in red in the lower right-hand side is Laodicea. Laodicea, in the biblical time of John's writing, was known primarily for three things. The first reason why they are part of the seven churches here is this was one of the greatest financial centers in all of the known biblical world at this time. They had so much money that in 60 AD, when there was a giant earthquake and a majority of the buildings in Laodicea were destroyed, they sent a note to the emperor saying, we're okay. We don't need any financial help from Rome. We can take care of this ourselves. Are you starting to see the problem? There's a self-sufficiency here. Um, When Rome needed money, they went to Laodicea and some of the financial centers that were there. There was so much of of a financial bubble in, in and around Laodicea that they began to put their trust in finances and not in looking to the Lord for what it is that they needed. Item number two. This was the only producer of black wool in the entire region. You'll hear me say a little bit later that Laodicea actually sat up on a plateau. Uh, This was good land for sheep. And in this particular region, there were sheep with black wool. That black wool was highly prized throughout the region. It, It had a glossy, a beautiful feel to it. And if you were able to afford clothes made out of the black wool in Laodicea, you were somebody. This was a, not just a financial center, this was an industrial center that was very well known throughout the region. Last, they had a medical center here and it wasn't just a hospital where physicians were trained in the early art of medicine, but historians tell us that there was a treatment for blindness that this particular hospital was known for. There was a salve that could be applied to your eyes that helped a significant number of folks. Now let's put all of this together and go back to what Emily told us was this passage of scripture. They're rich. They have beautiful clothing. They have a hospital that's known for curing blindness. Now what does scripture say? In verse number 18, I'm sorry, 17, because you say, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, and I have need of nothing, thou knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. This is beautiful, folks. This is the loving Lord Jesus who says, this is what you think, and this is what it really is. You think that you're rich. Let me tell you something. You're spiritually poor. You're in the poorhouse. You're exactly opposite of what you think. You believe that because this is an area where there is technological sophistication, that you're better than somebody else. That's just not the case. I want you to have the kind of gold that you can only have from a gift that I give you. I want you to have clothing, spiritual clothing, that helps distinguish you from everybody else in a positive way. You think that because there's a medical center there that you figured this out, you're wrong. This started me thinking. I wonder what it is that our church thinks that we do particularly well. 
Hmm. One of the things that I do in my civilian life is uh, research. And so I decided to do a little research. This is an unscientific scientific poll. Are you ready? I talked to about 10%, statistically significant number, about 10% of our church populace. I interviewed pastors, I interviewed elders, I interviewed some of the deacons and deaconesses and some of the folks who are sitting in the pews this morning. And I had two questions for them. Question number one, what is it that you think we do particularly well? Mm, be careful. And what is it that you think that community evangelical church can do a little bit better than what we have done in the past? You wanna know what the results were? Let's take a look. Next slide, please. Next slide. There we go. Almost with, without exception, the folks that I talked to said, we have a biblical focus here. Everything that we do is really centered around this book. And I thought, what a wonderful thing. Then I started to think, you know, we have been irreparably touched by COVID. This church is not the same church that it was a year ago. If we ever, my friends, if we ever get to the place where we think it's okay if we come to church one day out of the month because the rest we can watch on television. If we allow ourselves to be deluded in that way and we start pulling away from what God says is an essential community. Now let me back up a little bit. There are justifiable reasons why folks are not here this morning. I'm, I'm not talking about a vacation, that's important. I'm, I'm not talking about people who are physically challenged. There are reasons why you can't come. But if we get to the place where we think we have it under control, we don't really need to gather together on a regular consistent basis. I think we're moving in a wrong direction. The second thing that this poll revealed is our church believes that we're pretty good at caring for others in our church. Kathy and I were in the military for almost 30 years. We traveled around, we were members of churches in each one of those assignments, there were nine of them. What I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt is that there are needs, there are people who are sitting here right now in this room who are really hurting. Maybe you're on the verge of a divorce here this morning. There's not a lot of love in your house. Maybe you have a child that's, that's severely ill, COVID or, or maybe not COVID. I know that there are needs here that are not being met. So we have to be careful when we stand up and say, this is what we need to be known for. Just be careful. Ministry to children. Thank you, Carolyn. This is something that our church as a church body believes about what happens down the hallway. And they're right. It's terrific. If you were part of Vacation Bible School, you could have seen that for yourself. But she knows and I know that unfortunately the investment that you make in children is probably not even visible for 10 or 15 years, yes? It's just something that we are called to do on a consistent, regular basis. Let's not put our faith and trust in what we do. This stuff is, is difficult to measure and we can't brag. Let me tell you what the right attitude is. Uh, take your Bibles and turn back with me or your electronic devices. We're just going to take a look at two passages of Scripture, just two. In the book of Romans, chapter 12, we're, we're talking about right Christian conduct in Paul's letter to the Romans. In Romans chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 3, we shouldn't think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but we ought to think soberly accordingly as, as God has given each of us a measure of faith. Look down at verse number 16. We should be men and women of low estate. Be not wise in your own eyes. Be very careful what it is that we confess that we're pretty good at. So let's go to that condemnation uh, from the Heavenly Father. What does he mean when he says, I wish that you were either hot or cold? 
Surely the Heavenly Father doesn't wish that there were cold people in the church. If you go back in the commentaries, what you'll find out is that <clears throat> Laodicea was situated on top of a plateau and there was no natural water source there. So Laodicea, as a city, gets its water from hot springs and it's transported by a viaduct into the city. So when it arrives, it is lukewarm. And that is what the Lord is trying to do here. He's trying to paint a picture so that they can accurately see what their faith is like. And he says, you just think you're hot stuff. Actually, you're lukewarm, and it's so bad, I want to spit you out of my mouth. Wow. <clears throat> it, it may not seem like it to you, but trapped inside of this body is a long-distance runner. I did that when I was in high school and college, and there are a couple of marathons uh, that, that um, part of that experience. Uh, a marathon is a very unique race. It's 26 miles, but at, at various points along the way, there are volunteers who set up a table. And on the table, they put little paper cups, and in the paper cup, they pour cold, refreshing water. And if you're running 26 miles, you know exactly where those water stops are, and you look forward to that cool water. It refreshes. And if you ever watch a marathon race on television, you've got to have something better to do, but if you ever do, you'll see those racers grab that cup and they only drink about half of it and the others, they, the rest they pour on their heads. It cools them off. If you are a jogger instead of a runner, what happens is by the time you get to that water stop, that little cup of water has been sitting out in the sun for a fair amount of time. And when I grab that cup and put that water in my mouth, it's lukewarm. And the only thing you can bear to do is just swish it around in your mouth and spit it out because it's not very refreshing and it certainly isn't very cool. I think that the Christians who are listening to this letter at Laodicea understood exactly what the Lord meant. You think you're hot stuff, but you better be careful. What is God's antidote? Verse number 18. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in a fire, that thou mayest be rich, thou mayest have white, ma white raiment, white clothes, that you can be clothed well, that the shame of your nakedness doesn't appear, and you can anoint your eyes with eye salve so that you can see. This is a beautiful passage of scripture to the church at Laodicea because it takes in words they would understand what the problem is and presents to them a, a real solution. And folks, I want us to see a real solution today too. We shouldn't walk away from this place confused about the purpose for this letter for us individually. What does genuine faith really look like? Next slide. What does it look like? I think it takes a lot of guts to stand up here and tell you what genuine faith looks like. I can't do that very well. But let me make a couple of suggestions. Number one, this comes from the other side of that survey. Let's go back and think a little bit. We know what we think we do well. What is it that we as a community think we can do a little bit better? Next slide. Number one is ministry to the community. What does that mean? Are there folks in your own neighborhood who need some help in some way? We have a community of Nepalese immigrants that's growing and right across the street from Kathy and I, uh, yesterday there was a young man who had pulled out his lawnmower and I'm sure he hadn't read the instructions, but he was having an awful time just getting a lawnmower started. There's an opportunity for you to walk across the street. Do folks in your neighborhood need babysitting? 
Is there someone who would appreciate a, uh, some, some freshly baked cookies? Is there some way that you can impact your neighborhood for the cause of Christ? Tone and Neil Hess are at the head of an immigrant ministry in our church, and they have regular opportunities for us to be involved with folks who aren't dressed like us, who don't talk like us. I don't know about you, but that's a little intimidating for me. I'm going to work up the courage to go spend a little bit more time talking to those folks who have made their way into our church. I'd love to encourage you to do the same thing. Number two, more volunteers in church. This is something you have told me. We need more volunteers. I, I dare say that if you walk to the back of the sanctuary today and you talk to Carolyn, she would be able to tell you where the holes are in children's ministry and where we could use a little bit of extra help. I'm not asking you if you think you should help. I'm asking you what you think you should be doing. What I need to do in addition to, to what's already going on. We can ask. Uh, there are a series of videos that have been put up on our um, Facebook site. Each one of the deacons and deaconesses has asked for help in the area that they are now responsible for. If you can bake cookies, there's a place for you to work in this church. If you can make a meal, there's a place for you. If you can work with children, and the list goes on and on and on. If you can pull weeds, there's a place for you. I want to challenge you this morning to look for that place of service. And number three, a greater focus on evangelism. We have a tremendous missions outreach program here. I'm wondering if there is anyone in this sanctuary besides Volker and Karen who can name four of the missionaries that are up on our board. Now I realize, again, as I point a finger here, there are three more pointed back at me. I'm just as guilty. But the church has decided that over the next couple of weeks, you're going to be hearing some encouraging messages from missionaries themselves with opportunities for you to get involved. I want to prepare the way for that by looking at one passage of Scripture that found its way into our reading this morning. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him. Think about that for just a minute. If you knock, he will come in. The latch is on the inside of the door. The Lord is not going to burst into your life. He's not going to demand that you immediately move your entire household to Africa. That's not the way this works. But inviting the Lord Jesus to take over more of who we are and what we do is the ultimate goal for those who are at Laodicea and for you and for me too. The Lord Jesus tells the folks at Laodicea they need to repent. That word repent is interesting. It means to do an about face. It means to turn 180 degrees and begin going in the other direction. I don't know where each of you are as you sit here this morning, but I can tell you that the Lord's desire is to fall fresh on you, to give you a fresh dose of his spirit so that you can be a true witness to him. You can be a faithful one. There is a promise that comes to the, to the people in this church in Laodicea. I want you to see that promise because right now we've had negative, 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 but it's going to turn out to be something beautiful. Well, let me close with a short story. There was a father who loaded his five-year-old daughter into their convertible and put the top down and went for a glorious ride on a Monday afternoon. They went through the countryside and that breeze was blowing through her hair. It was just a great time with her dad. And they got into the city and they noticed when they were in the city that there were fire engines that had come out from the fire station and the firemen were there and, and they were washing and uh, applying another coat of wax to the fire trucks. And the little girl looked at her dad and said, Dad, what, what are they doing? 
The dad said, sweetheart, they do that once a week. They bring all the fire trucks out and they make sure that all the equipment is working well. And they put another coat of wax on it and then they put it back in the garage and they're waiting for a fire. I certainly hope that no one can confuse that scenario with what you and I do on a week in, week out basis. If you come to church, if I come to church to get cleaned up a little bit and apply one more coat of theological wax so we can feel good about ourselves and we leave this place, then we have missed out on the purpose for this church. Let me close with, with this thought. To him that overcomes, if you repent, Jesus is telling the church at Laodicea, if you repent, I will grant you to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame. And I'm sit down with my father in heaven. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. What an incredible promise. Think about that for just a second. Can you imagine in your mind what it's like to sit with the Lord Jesus, with God in heaven? That is the prize for a faithful one. Are you faithful? I hope so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for putting this message to the church at Laodicea into black and white so that we can take a look at not just the challenges that you gave them, but also that promise at the end. Father, we want to sit with you. We want to be with you. So fall fresh on us. We need that faithfulness. I want to thank you, Father, for your movement in this church. Help us to consider how we might turn this call to faithfulness into action. Father, move our feet and our hands so that there's no doubt we will not fall into the same category as Laodicea, but we will be a church loved and appreciated. And we'll thank you for doing that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue worship through song this morning.
words as you go from Philippians chapter 1. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve of what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, 
filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. May it be so in us. Amen. You're dismissed.